the gravity of the time is such that every new avenue of peace, no matter how dimly discernible, should be explored. Never before in history has so much hope for so many people been gathered together in a single organization. You will provide a great share of the wisdom, of the courage, and the faith which can bring to this world lasting peace for all nations and happiness and well-being for all men. Okay, so we're here today on Titans of Nuclear with Tammy Ma, who is the lead of the Inertial Fusion Energy Initiative at Lawrence Livermore National Labs. It is so great to have you on. Thank you so much for joining us, Tammy. Thank you so much, Brett. It's it's an honor and a pleasure. Yeah, well, obviously, so, you know, some great news has come uh, come from your facility over these last few weeks. And I'd love to get into that. But before we do, we'd love to learn about you as a person. So start off by telling us, where did you grow up? Oh, I actually grew up uh, here in the Bay Area in Northern California. Um, in It's Fremont, actually, which is just over the hill from the lab. It's about 20 miles away. Um, so in high school, I actually got to participate in some of like the lab outreach events. They used to do something called, or we actually still do something called Science on Saturday, where, you know, scientists give public lectures about their work. And I do remember hearing a talk about uh, the National Ignition Facility and huge lasers and fusion. And at the time, I didn't understand a whole lot, right? Um, but I got inspired by the idea of doing like big science, working on big teams, um, and knew I wanted to come back to the lab um, come come work at the lab someday. Um, and so I've, I've been very lucky that that's, that's the way it's worked out. Um, and I've gotten to, um, my family's still here in the Bay Area, so I get to live close by to them. Who were some of the early influences in your life that got you excited about science and engineering and technology? Oh, absolutely. My parents. Um, uh, my dad was an electrical engineer. Um, my mom was not a scientist, um, but they just would get so excited about science breakthroughs and um, take us to science museums. They love science. And so that actually trickled down. Um, both my brother and I are now physicists, actually. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. I, that's something I always like to hone in on because, you know, like some people, it's kind of unfortunate, like, if you don't have an engineer in the family, sometimes you don't even know what engineering is. Um, and I think we definitely have to like increase people's exposure. I mean, I think they've done a good job getting STEM more on the agenda in general, but it often is that some of the best engineers had family members who are engineers who like coached and guided and pushed them from a very early age. Yeah, I, I mean, I completely agree. I had no idea what research meant, right? Um, and, you know, it was it, it was a combination of things, parents, but also like I had some really great science teachers in, in middle school and high school. And that makes all the difference too, right? If they did can you do teach... competitions like science Olympiads and stuff like that. I did not. I did not. Um, it wasn't big at my school at the time. Um, now, but... your school, Fremont, that's where the big automotive manufacturing facility was, right? Did that trickle yeah. into the school system and stuff? Yeah, so actually my dad worked at, um, it was the, the Toyota plant, which has now turned into the Tesla. The Tesla plant, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's not it's not just that uh, factory, that facility, it's just being in Silicon Valley also, right? There's a lot of educated people. Um, there's always a lot of new breakthroughs and excitement around tech and science. Um, and I think that seeped into, my, seeped into my bones personally, yeah. Sure, sure. Okay, great. And then so uh, walk us through your academic experience a little bit more as well. Where'd you go to school, grad school, that stuff? Sure. Um, I did my undergraduate at Caltech, the California Institute of Technology. Quite a um, school. It was hard. <laughs> I have to say I cried a lot, um, but I picked to go there because I wanted um, to be an aerospace engineer. Um, and Caltech happens to run and operate the um, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is the NASA laboratory in charge of all non-manned missions. And so for me, that was just like the dream, right? Um, and so I, I did major in aerospace um, and then decided to go to graduate school. Um, and um, I thought I was going to do work in plasma thrusters because um, I had done a little bit of, of summer research as an undergrad on that. You know, I was looking around for advisors, um, ended up going into plasma physics. Um, and with plasma physics, 
you start to, there's, there's all different applications of plasma physics in different regimes. Um, and I, I ended up going into fusion. Um, and so I did my graduate school at uh, UC San Diego. So um, you can see there's a pattern. I've uh, stayed in California pretty much my entire life. And did they have experimental facilities there or was it more theoretical at this point in your um, experience? Well, so um, um, we at San Diego did not have big lasers. Um, there were smaller labs, of course, but not big lasers to do. But still experimental and not theoretical physics. Experimental. But what I ended up doing was actually traveling around during my graduate years to different laser facilities, including here at Livermore, to do experiments. So How did that happen? Did the school sponsored that or is it a specific program or you just make it happen on your own? Um, it's, it's um, you know, the professor gets his his funding grants from... NSF or Department of Energy or whatever, and that pays for um, the execution of these experiments. And you can have money to actually send students to travel around and do that work. And what was your thesis specifically? Um, it was <laughs> it was on. Uh, I think the title of it was "Transport of Energetic Electrons um, for Fast Ignition Fusion." Um, what that means is you you take a laser, and if you shoot, say, a solid, um, the laser is so intense that it it liberates the electrons from the rest of the atom and you basically you generate plasma and those electrons get accelerated get very high energy and you can use that um as a as a heater for different uh, fusion mechanisms cool and um when the electrons emit is it directional or do you just very quickly control the direction with like a magnetic field well, no, that's a great question. Um, they're they're somewhat directional. They also have like a, a spectrum of energy. So it's not one single energy. So the name of the game is exactly that. How do you control what energy comes out? Um, how do you control where those electrons go? Um, and so, you know, work on that is ongoing. It's a very difficult problem. Can you help describe, <laughs> since you probably spent a lot of time thinking about this, can you help me create a a visual understanding or an analogy for what an electron actually is. Protons and neutrons, I got it. I think of like a small circle closely packed together with mass. <laughs> what is an electron? Um, uh, so an electron is, you know, a negatively charged particle. So like and it's a said, particle? It's actually a particle? Are we sure? It is, yes. Okay. Whoa, am I sure? <laughs> Are we getting theoretical here? Because um, it's just so small, it doesn't have much mass. I mean, how do we really? You know, it's like... No, it, no, it's definitely a particle. Um, and so you know, the electron um is what's interesting about the electron is, like you said, the the protons and the neutrons are packed close together, creating the nucleus. The electrons, you know, kind of circle around um the the nucleus, and they contain um a ton of energy and they actually form a little more of a cloud rather than having discrete places that they always are. Um, but what's interesting about electrons is they are discretized in their energy in the sense of once you liberate, if you can, it, it takes a, a very definite amount of energy to pull an electron off. And then you very specifically might emit X-rays or other, other signatures that that happened. Um, and then each electron in its particular place also has a very specific energy. And so you can do very, very cool physics with that if you know what you're, if you can record, you know, as you're pulling uh, electrons off or adding electrons back in, um, what's actually going on in the core of this atom. And okay, one more question on electrons for now. <laughs> this idea of them existing in this cloud, that's more of like a probabilistic interpretation of their position. What it, how do we describe their motion though? Is it an orbit or are they just like randomly appearing in different places at different times? Yeah, I mean, we still we still call it an orbit, but it's not, you know, in, in your high school textbook, right? We draw these little circles rather than uh, a 2D circle. It's actually a 3D sphere that electrons are moving in, right? Um, and so um, it, it, it's still accurate to call it an orbital, um, where where that electron actually resides is a function of the the, the coulomb energy the repulsion um the attraction and repulsion forces um that sets exactly kind of where the electron is with respect to the nucleus but it is 
um, moving within that orbital, or yeah. it is appearing and being in places within it that is orbital. it is moving in that it orbital. It is moving. Okay, okay. Yeah. So there is motion. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. All right. That was just a personal curiosity you satisfied. All right. Now let's continue on to what happened post grad school. Sure. Um, oh, okay. So grad school. Yeah. So um, so I did both my master's and my PhD um, at UC San Diego. Again, like I said, I was traveling around. Um, I think towards the end, the last two-ish years of my graduate school, I actually moved up here to Livermore to work more closely with the scientists here and the facilities we had on site. Um, and then I graduated in 2010, which was fortuitous because the National Ignition Facility, the world's largest and most energetic laser, was just coming online. We had just completed construction of the facility. We're just starting experiments. Cool. You know, we needed experimentalists to, to develop and do cool experiments there. And what um, was the purpose when, when Congress was first asked for money for the National Ignition Facility? What was the intended purpose of it? Um, uh, multiple folds, um, certainly to, um, but the main purpose is what we call science-based stockpile stewardship. Um, and so um, this is almost a little bit change of topic, so bear with me. Um, uh, what science-based stockpile stewardship means is that uh, in 1992, um, we put a moratorium on underground explosive nuclear testing. This is a comprehensive test ban treaty, um, and it is something that you know we, the U.S. and many countries around the world, agreed to. Right? We're not going to test anymore. However, we, the U.S. and many other countries still have nuclear arsenals, right? Um, and what that means is, is nuclear weapons that we had previously built buried under the ground. Um, okay, cool. So they're there, right? Um, and, but we can't, we can't um, explode one every once in a while to see if they still work. So how do we ensure that that stockpile stays safe, secure, and effective, you know, if, God forbid, we did need to use it, but more importantly, to use it as a deterrent, right? Of course, of their, course. their usage as, as, you know, warning other countries completely disappears if we don't know if they work or not, yes. right? Um, and so the NIP was constructed to feed into this um, because with the NIF, we can generate conditions, the very high temperatures, densities, pressures, similar to what you have inside nuclear weapons at a very tiny scale. So to be clear, you know, we are not generating, we're not building new nuclear weapons. Um, we're not detonating bombs. We can just study similar physics on the NIF. And that same physics, we can then feed into our, our simulation computer codes, right? Um, and make sure that our codes are accurate against the physics. And those same codes are what we use to ensure that the stockpile stays safe and effective. So let me try to paraphrase for our audience. So we have these compute, in order to not have to do experimental testing, we wanna do this analytical testing on a computer. But these computer programs, especially physics simulators are really quite complex. Like they are hard even for the best coders and best physicists to, to compile um, these computer programs. And so often we have to benchmark the results against something in reality to fine tune, you know, twist this die a little bit, change that algorithm a little bit. And so rather than testing them against blowing something up, we're testing them against something that is still in the same realm of physics, but is wholly different. And that's what the NIF facility is. That is exactly right. Thank you. That was a great explanation. No, um, it came from you. I was just yeah, trying to learn it. Yeah, great. Yeah, that, that is exactly it. Um, and then the other point is um, to train up, you know, um, people like me and my colleagues who are the stewards of this, this physics, um, you know, how do how do we make sure that we have that those exquisite skills that are also tend to be a little bit unique, right? Um, and, and make sure that we have that continuing. Um, and that also is a deterrence um, to our adversaries because they it's a very visible um, signal of the expertise that we have in this arena. Yeah, um, to keep smart people, you need to give them toys to play with. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, great. So now um, teach me about some of these experiments that happened, um, you know, throughout your career and, and what culminated in this uh, momentous occasion. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the NIF runs 24-7. Um, um, it is, um, like I mentioned before, the world's largest, most energetic laser. Um, it is actually 192 
separate lasers, each one alone, one of the most energetic. So you can imagine we're combining 192 of them, like you said, Brett, pretty cool toy, right? Um, and um, the building that it's housed in um, is the size of three football fields, side by side, 10 wow. stories tall. So it, it's enormous. Wow. And the reason the building is so big is we have to house um, thousands, thousands of optics, right, for each of these lasers. Um, and those optics are what we use to amplify the lasers up in energy. So we are not talking about your typical little laser pointer, right? We are talking about ginormous lasers um, that can then, what we do then is we take all of this laser energy and we're gonna shine it back down um, on a tiny target. Um, and this target contains our fusion fuel, which for us is deuterium and tritium, these isotopes of hydrogen. Um, and the target, um, sits in a, a tiny capsule, about two millimeters in diameter. And that capsule sits in what we call a whole ROM. It's a little canister, um, something that is made of something that's high Z, so high up the periodic table. So we typically- High Z, Z, high Z, Z, like Z. the weight of the element. Exactly, right. So um, gold for us or depleted uranium. The idea is when you use these high Z, um, materials, we're going to take the laser energy, shine it on the whole room, and then the whole room generates x-rays. And so back to our earlier conversation about electrons, when you use a high Z material, something far up the periodic table, it means there's more electrons, more electrons you can liberate, and therefore you get more x-rays. And we use these- but The x-rays are not a particle. The x-rays are not, no, that's right. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, so the so the X-rays um, then kind of fill this little canister and we generate an X-ray oven. So like your oven at home, where the idea there is you're trying to get uniform heating, right? All in a small space so that you cook. For us, we're using X-rays to cook our little capsule. Um, and the capsule, then that little shell that I talked about, um, which is typically plastic or some sort of carbon, it ablates, so it blows off super fast. Um, and then it's it's a rocket-like reaction. So by conservation of momentum, you're blowing off the shell super fast, the rest of it wants to compress in really quickly. Um, and then that's how we compress the fusion fuel up to high densities. It'll also get incredibly hot. Um, and then if it's hot enough, dense enough, and you hold it just long enough together, then you get uh, fusion ignition, so more energy out than you put in, and that is the name of the game, and that's what we achieved last December. And um, help just so our audience can visualize like the physical parameters of the system. Okay, so we started off with this three football field, ten stories high, houses all of this laser equipment. The um, the final like layer of optics of all of these um, lasers. How close do they sit to um, the target? Um, yeah, great question. So, um, so right. So the lasers are going to be bouncing back and forth in this ginormous facility, uh, getting amplified up. Then they all get pointed around this target chamber. So it's this enormous uh, vacuum chamber that is spherical. Um, it's a huge ball. Um, and it is 10 meters or 30 feet in diameter. Got it. Um, so, so and and it's held at vacuum. Um, because lasers, our lasers need to propagate in, in vacuum, otherwise they would get disturbed, basically. Um, and um, this this target chamber basically weighs, it's made out of aluminum, 130,000 uh, pounds. And then it was so big, we actually had to put the target chamber in first and build the facility <laughs> around it to give you a sense of size. That's awesome. Um, okay. And then how is the pellet suspended? I'm assuming it's in the middle of this chamber, this vacuum yeah. chamber. How yeah. is it suspended in the middle of the Yeah, so um I love how you're breaking this down. Um the target sits on this enormous boom arm that pushes in and out of the target chamber, right? So I said before that the target the, the chamber is 30 feet in diameter. In order to hold the target in the middle, that boom has to be at least 15 feet, right? The the radius. Um, and so it is, it's this arm um, that is incredibly stable. Like, can you imagine like holding your arm out and you have to hold that target to a precision of about 20 microns. So that's about a 10th of a human hair. 
Wow. So are you using a lot of like piezoelectrics at the very end to get that final positioning or something? I I don't actually even know. I think so. Yeah. Um, and and there's there's um uh there's uh piezo electrodes farther back too, right? Like that's to hold the arm very stably. Um and then each laser then as it as it approaches the target chamber gets um focused down. So each laser um comes down to about 200 microns, like so two human hair-ish um size, um, pointed very specifically on a certain location on that target. Um, and so there's not only is the NIF the biggest laser in the world, it's also the most precise laser in the world in many different ways. Cool. And then um, does that boom arm interfere with the, because I assume, okay, so you, and I understand this is more of like a test facility rather than um, a prototype of a commercial power production facility, but would that perhaps be an engineering complication to, I assume you probably want to have as few materials as possible as close to the um, source of the um, of the reaction from a, you know, how do you deal with extra materials in your, like, you know, a neutron uh, envelope? Uh, yeah, I mean, for, for these particular experiments, you were exactly right, right? It is, it's a scientific demonstration facility. Um, the boom is, is what it is, and then there's, you know, different parts holding the target farther out. Um, the target gets obliterated um, every shot. Uh, we make sure of that. In fact, um, you don't want chunks of debris actually falling back onto the laser and the optics, right? Yeah. How, how um, big is how big is the target again? Can you... Oh yeah. So the 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 little sphere that I was talking about is two millimeters in diameter. The whole rom that it sits in is about a centimeter in length, half a centimeter in diameter. Oh, the whole rom is that small. That's the yeah, thing that so the translates whole thing is tiny. your laser your laser energy into gamma energy. Or you said X-ray, is it? X-ray, X-ray. Okay. And it is yeah. X-ray? Okay, okay. It is X-ray, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, you can imagine that target being so tiny that the lasers have to be super precise to even yeah. hit it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, we have an analogy that um, the lasers um, are equivalent to a pitcher standing on a pitcher mountain at a Giants Stadium in San Francisco. And then pitching a perfect strike down at Dodger Stadium in LA <laughs> to give you a sense of scale. That's so good. That's so good. Um, cool. Uh, and then that little pellet, what are the materials in that pellet again? Is it pure um, a DT or what, what did you? What, it is. What? Yeah. So it is deuterium tritium. Yep. Um, what we have to do is before we, you know, right before we put the, the target, push the target into the chamber, we have to fill that pellet. Um, with the DT field. And so there's actually a little straw that sticks into this capsule. Um, we feed liquid DT in at 50-50 concentration. What we actually have to do then is actually bring the temperature down um, and freeze that DT into an ice. So just like water ice, H2O ice, in this case, it's just DT. And, and, and so is that because you, um, in order to increase the probability of a reaction, you want um, the um, atom distance from one to another to be closer physically, and that's what? You're no, thinking? no, that's actually, you know, it's not, it's not close enough at that point, right? Okay. Um, um, it's actually because we need to pack enough fuel in there that you could have propagating the burn. density of fuel. Yeah, okay. but there's also a trick. What we do is we hold them. We bring the temperature right down to around the triple point. Um, and so actually there's a DT ice layer, but right in the center, it is actually gas. And so gas is more compressible. But we need that ice layer of hydrogen of the deuterium and tritium fuel mixture. Okay. Are there any other uh, elements in there? No. But but there kind of have to be some small percentage, right? Because your tritium has what, like a two-year half-life or something? So like it can't be pure in the sense that from the time that you made it to the time you get it in there, there's got to be some other stuff mixed in, right? So it, so um, it's about a, I think it's 12.3 year half-life. Um, you do, yeah, you get a little bit of decay, like you get beta decay. So you form other particles, but it's not other atoms. There's no other materials. Okay. It is pure deuterium and tritium. 
and then the the yes, capsule around so, it. Oh, right, because you're so low on the periodic table anyway. There's not much else it could become in your decay. Yeah, no, that that's actually that's actually right. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then um, what percentage of your like of your mass actually gets converted in this reaction when you fire? Um. So that the amount of fusions that you have fusion because you're going to fuse deuterium tritium and in that reaction you generate a helium nucleus what we call an alpha particle and that energetic neutron right so the number of fusions that we actually create is directly related to the amount of energy you generate um and so um for us on that december shot where we got ignition we actually burned through just four percent of the fuel and, is, and so is you can imagine constant. you know if you could have a more efficient reaction and burn through much more of that how much more energy would you generate right or could you repeat the laser shining process i'm calling it shining sorry it's probably the wrong yeah. word yeah. on <laughs> that same pellet to eject to like eke more out of it oh so you can definitely change the behavior of the laser so for us when we say we shine the laser on it's not again, like your laser pointer at home, right? Where you turn on and off. Right. For us, we can very carefully modulate the power output as a function of time. So we actually do little bumps up in laser energy and we turn it back down, little bump up, big rise up. And what that does actually is send shock waves very precisely to do the compression. And when you say it sends shock waves, I'm thinking of like, you know, those funny experiments that you see where people like, make you know, use sound waves to make like water move and you can create different like is this essentially um is it that you are trying to have the shock waves intersect at a point to yeah. like create okay yeah exactly so because we're doing a spherical compression so we're sending in spherical shocks to fully compress that capsule down got it got yeah. it and it's that yeah. compression that increases the probability that your deuterium and your tritium will interact with each other? Let me- Where it's actually I overcoming would, the Coulomb energy. I would, yeah, I would say we do the compression to get up to the densities and generate the heat that we need to overcome the Coulomb repulsion between the deuterium. Okay, so it's all about overcoming the, the Coulomb energy. Yeah, it is, it is. And, that's, and that's for, the for DT, what is that? It's like a hundred million degrees or something? What is it? Oh, it is, um, well, it, it's it's a spectrum, right? It becomes more probable the hotter you get. Um, and it peaks. Oh, it, where's it, the peak? Yeah, where's the peak? Yeah. It's 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 around um, 10 kV. So that's, um, I think that's 100 million degrees Celsius, if I'm doing the math right in my head. Okay, yeah. 10 kV is right, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool. And then um, how do you measure again? How do you measure the energy output? Yeah, so um, the energy comes out in that energetic neutron that is generated in the fusion reaction. And how many neutron, if you're doing four, I, I don't remember your initial mass, but you're getting 4% of it. So how many neutrons total are coming out in this in this event? Oh, uh, for, for that big ignition shot, um, we had over 10 to the 17th neutrons. Cool. So, yeah, that's and a then, lot of zeros, right? And then you're able to count them by essentially having a detector over a certain area at a certain distance away and then it's just you just count exactly exactly and we have more than one detector certainly right they're they're arrayed all around the chamber we know the solid angle that that detector is measuring over we see the number of neutrons that arrive there and then just like you said we can then recalculate the total number and then and you're verify saying, it amongst different detectors. yeah i was about to say and what what is the difference um be to, like what is the sensitivity of any given one sensor and do you have to do some math on top of multiple sensors to figure out what the right number is yeah so we have we have 120 different instruments arrayed around the chamber they're not all for measuring neutrons um but a good number are um and those the detectors they're not only um they, they measure neutrons of different energies as well they're located at different places and in different distance from the center of the target chamber um, and what you want to do is measure the neutrons coming at the detector right there and make sure that you are consistent. You across all the detectors, 
and of course, you're not going to get exactly the same number problem. So then you get an error bar on your measurement, right? Um, the other thing, one very accurate way that we also measure the neutrons is by activation. And so certain materials, right, it's, it's as simple as just a little solid foil. It could be copper, it could be tantalum. Um, you, they're arrayed all around the chamber and they get activated. When the neutron comes in, that material gets into an excited state. Um, and then it has a half-life of decay that you can measure very accurately over time. Um, and then use that also um, as a detector. Um, and those decays actually do take time though, right? Sometimes hours, sometimes weeks. And so that's right, why right after a shot, you know, we know something big happened, but it still takes time to, to verify the number. Um, and as scientists, we wanna be rigorous and make sure we also have good error bars and understand the uncertainty um, in the number that we quote. And then, um... Uh, these neutrons, they're non-directional. Is it equal to neutron? Like, does it emit in every direction with an equal probability? Um, uh, for our fusion reactions, yes, because it is a thermal reaction. We just have, you know, um, a, a pellet that is spherical, right? That's filled with deuterium tritium. And so the fusions should happen in a way that neutrons are omnidirectional in how they are emitted. You said However, sure. <laughs> they should be. Um, not always, because what happens is when you do the compression, you're not always perfectly symmetric and spherical, right? You, you, you. It's like compressing a balloon in between your fingers. It's really hard. Anywhere it can, it's gonna push back out, right? And for us, it's a similar thing. We have 192 lasers. It's still not, you know, enough to. It's it's tough. It's really tough to to squeeze something symmetrically, um, and so. But that's important. It is a signature for us. We can measure the neutrons and we can see the asymmetry. And that's a signature for us of where we might need to improve the implosion on the next experiment. Cool, so cool. And then how do you deal with like neutron scattering like as it inter intersects with that boom arm or other parts of your equipment? A, a neutron is gonna, you know, some are gonna scatter, some are gonna get absorbed. How do you, how do you account for that? Or at least mathematically, how do you, uh, model or understand where they went before they hit your final detector? Right. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, we can model, you know, first off with very good simulations. Um, there are very good neutron particle scattering um, uh, computer simulations, right, that you can model all of this and know kind of what to expect. Um, and then we can also do um, you know, test shots where we know we're emitting a certain number of neutrons. Let's see where they go. Make sure that our diagnostics are calibrated against things like scattering or the spectrum being a little bit different from what we expect. Um, so all of that is taken into account mathematically um, as we do the analysis. Yes. And um, this goal of putting um or getting more energy out than you put in. How long has that been the goal of this particular apparatus? Um, well, or was this, it even, or is this just a fun experiment on top of its other? Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it absolutely was a goal. Um, the idea of getting more energy out than you put in through a fusion reaction with lasers has been going on for over 60 years now, basically. 60, six, six zero. Six zero, since the laser was invented about two days afterwards, somebody came up, one of our you know, former lab directors actually came up with the idea, oh, well, why don't we use lasers for fusion? And so um, here at Livermore, and we're not the only ones doing laser fusion, um, but here at Livermore, we've had a series of bigger and bigger, more energetic lasers. Now the NIF itself, um, we started construction in 1997, we completed in 2009. And so we've been doing experiments from then through to today, which is about 13 years. Um, and uh, yes, it, it's always been a goal because once you achieve ignition, you are in this different plasma regime where it's like you light a match, right? And your match, that little flame propagates. Um, for us, that propagating burn puts us in what we call the burning plasma regime. Um, and um, you can generate um, huge amounts of what we call high yield, lots of neutrons that you can use for other experiments. And furthermore, it opens the path towards fusion energy as a viable energy source someday. Because um, of course, if you can generate more energy than you put in, right, 
if you can turn that up even more, very easily you can see how maybe we can start feeding that out to the grid. And then the key is how do you make it self-sustaining? Because you don't want to have to power up the laser every time for every shot, right? No, we would power the laser up every shot. Oh. Um, in a So the NIF, like you alluded to earlier, Brett, is a scientific demonstration facility, right? We do an experiment once every four to eight hours or so um, by design, right? And our experiments are very complex. Everyone's a little bit different. In a fusion power plant, we would need to repeat the reaction about 10 times a second. And so create, each time- um, To create what like power level of, of thermal energy output? Um, to the, the ideas, the, the, the plans that we have now would be to generate a gigawatt type power plant similar to our coal power plants of today. So 10, um, 10, 10 shots, shots a second can theoretically second. create a gigawatt or three gigawatts thermal of yeah, yeah uh, about a gigawatt uh gigawatt electric right yeah okay, so yes, then like you can thermal. okay yeah um wow. and but right so there's still many many challenges ahead not only would you have to do it 10 times a second we would need quite a bit higher gain than we've demonstrated so far and how um how involved is your group with the effort to commercialize this technology for power production versus scientific achievement? Yeah, um, um, not just scientific achievement, but also what we call the stockpile stewardship. Sorry, and, and our defense right? goals. I yeah. should have started yeah. with that. Yes, yes, yeah. I didn't mean to do um, that. No, um, so um, we, um, uh, I just started a new job actually, and my job is the lead of inertial fusion energy initiative here at Livermore, which is exactly that, you know, how do we take this and translate it into uh, what could be a viable energy source? And what was your job before, right before? Um, and I'm still doing it. Um, I run a, a scientific group uh, using these very high intensity lasers to do, um, you know, cool physics, fusion physics, um, what we call high energy density experiments, shock physics, all kinds of all kinds of things. Yeah. Okay, so now I want to ask the question more about you than about the science. How did you step into this role, uh, both from like a qualifications perspective, but also from an interest level perspective? What made you the perfect fit? Um, yeah, so, you know, I had done experiments on the NIF for, for years and years um, uh, in, in support of inertial confinement fusion, which is exactly you know, it could be exactly the approach that you would want to use for fusion energy. So right now, these different missions that you and I have talked about, Brett, stockpile stewardship, energy, um, even just some of the discovery sites itself are all aligned. It, it's exactly the same right now. Um, and then there's different applications, like so many of our different technologies, right? We are at the point where if we wanna go towards fusion energy, a lot of different technologies now need to be developed. Like right? the engineering part, not just the like thing. the engineering. And that's going to be a hell of a job. Exactly. Right. Um, and so, um, you know, for me, um, I started getting more into um, policy work a few years ago, um, you know, going to D.C. and working with our program managers at DOE headquarters, um, and, uh, you know, talking to staffers on the Hill um, to both, um, you know, share the work that we do here on the NIF, communicate the science, which is always super important, um, but then to start laying the groundwork for the future. You know, what we, you know, a lot of, there were a lot of skeptics, but, you know, here at Livermore, here at NIF, we, we believed we would get ignition. It was going to be imminent then what's the next step? We have to be ready, right? Um, and so starting a few years ago, I got very involved um, in that communication, working with the community to put together reports, um, you know, to Congress or to DOE to say, here are the challenges that we see, you know, in the next few years, this is where we would like to see investment to push the field forward. Um, and so that's how I, I got more involved in really growing this new program, which turns out is is more policy than it is technical, Okay, as I'm finding out. Well, you seem um, uh, quite capable of both. <laughs> Thank um, you. So uh, how do you balance, how do you balance 
Okay, this is more to like the, the social aspects of it mm. then. Mm. How do you balance the excitement around the achievement with... One thing that I'm afraid of is... Like, I mean, this is, I mean, it's amazing in the sense that we got so much like positive press. I mean, every newspaper reported on this. I, but then the reality of the engineering challenges mm -hmm. to turn this into a commercial power production facility could take how long you fill in the blank for me. Um, yeah. Um, no, it's, that's absolutely true. Right. Um, so, you know, what we've accomplished on the NIF is a huge scientific breakthrough, no matter what, right? Um, what we've been trying to do with our, our communications is be completely transparent and be very rigorous in how we talk about the science. We're not claiming that you could plug the NIF, you know, into the grid and pull pull energy out. We've been trying to articulate the many different challenges that are there, you know, not just in the science and technology that still needs to be developed, but also the support that we need from government and private companies and all these different stakeholders. Um, and, and use that in fact as a way of, of trying to communicate that, yeah, we still need investment and we still need you know, policy to be developed in a way that sustains this new technology. Um, and then making sure also for us, the US is the leader in inertial confinement fusion. That's undisputed, right? Um, yes, we would love to have fusion energy available to everybody around the world um, because it's such a, you know, a clean, abundant, wonderful source of energy if we can make it work. But, you know, the US has a leadership now. We need to maintain that leadership to capitalize on it to make fusion energy work, right? In the meantime, there's all these technology spinoffs there's just overall scientific prowess we need to maintain. Um, and so it, it doesn't benefit us to make promises that cannot be met, right? We need to articulate the challenge. Um, and, you know, we don't even have the staff right now, the workforce, right, um, to, to put multiple power plants on the grid anytime soon. We It takes years to build that up. Um, and so, um, you know, for me personally, I find that inspiring. And we hope that also is a message that can get out to, um, you know, school children today. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, but at the same time, when the media gets excited, right, that's great too. Yeah. Um, but we do, we do try to stress that it will take, you know, probably a few decades um, to, to make fusion energy um, something that is ready. Um, but, you know, that, that timeline very much, very, very much depends on the actual investment and the will, right? If if the U.S. makes a strong commitment now, we can move a whole lot faster. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think are the, um, other than understanding the physics, which you guys have demonstrated incredible prowess at, what are those next um, areas of focus that will enable a commercialization of this technology? Is it a set of material science challenges for the enclosure? Is it a way to make the um, laser optics more efficient? What What is the next set of technical challenges that you'd like to see investment in? Yeah, no, absolutely. You you totally hit the, the nail on the head. Materials is a big one, right? Mm -hmm. um, we need materials that can withstand huge uh, fluxes of of being irradiated or particles um, for what would be the chamber walls of the mm -hmm. reactor. Yep. Um, we need materials that are hardened. So, you know, the optics that deliver the laser, um, you can hide a lot of those optics in other places and shield them. However, you at some point, the laser needs to meet the target chamber and there has to be a final optic. How do you protect that? How do you prevent damage, right? Um, Especially with those damn omnidirectional neutrons. Yeah, exactly. Those neutrons are, they're, they're tough, right? <laughs> um, and um, um, so, so materials is a big one. Um, there's, there's work that needs to be done with a tr a tritium, processing and recycling um that's not the fuel source the fuel source itself right yeah um so tritium is is um a uh limited resource um so in a fusion power plant 
Um, we, we talked a little bit, you asked a little bit earlier about how much of the fuel do we actually burn up? You do not burn up 100% of the fuel. It is really tough to burn all that fuel up before it, the pressures get so large, it just like re-expands, right? Um, and so you would want to recapture any of the fuel that doesn't get used and repurpose it and recycle it and send it through the system again. So there's, there's a decent amount of work that needs to get done there. It is not an easy problem because um, you're working with the tiniest particle, sorry, the tiniest atom, the smallest atom that we have on the periodic table. It seeps into everything, yeah. right? Um, so um, that's one of the challenges. Um, there's challenges with automation and bringing in um, uh, machine yeah. learning. And AI, yeah. So automation, you know, you would drop a pellet in 10 times a second. Yeah. The lasers need to track it and shoot it. Um, but, you know, it things are moving so fast, you can't have human intervention, right? Everything needs to be controlled remotely. Um, also because it is, um, it's a power plant where there's lots of energy flowing in all different kinds of directions. You, know, um, you, just, and you just brought up something. You, said, you used the word drop it. And um, that does actually beg the question, given how precise you are already with your timing of the lasers, why hold the pellet instead of just dropping it and timing the lasers to meet? Because the, the speeds are relatively slow of it dropping and easy to calculate with gravity relative to your lasers. Yeah. Why, why not yeah. just let it drop and hit it right when center? And so in a power boom. plant, we would. But right okay. now for the scientific facility, right, we're only doing a shot. Okay. every couple of hours. And so it doesn't make sense at this point to add that additional That's level of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it, you're right. It would not be the most difficult subsystem that we need to bring up. There's work that needs to be done, but yeah. we and think we've got that challenge down, I think. Does this laser-driven um, approach work with other fusion uh, reactions other than DT? Yes. Specifically, um, aneutronic reactions would be my follow-on question. Yeah, um, there there are certainly some private companies looking at aneutronic reactions. Um, anything that is DT has the highest cross section. It's easy. Or, it it's is fun. it is the easiest one, right? And <laughs> it already took us sixty years to get it right. But it is the easiest one, right? The as you do other as you try to fuse other elements because they are bigger heavier than hydrogen, you need to put more energy into the system to even start those fusion reactions. Yeah. And um, so it just adds an additional level of difficulty. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where I was just thinking about it, though, is it's like, now that you demonstrated the concept, rather than tackle the engineer, there are going to be a lot of engineering challenges dealing with neutrons. If there is a way, now you demonstrate the concept to instead work on the challenges, just get more energy into the system and not have to deal with those pesky neutrons. Maybe that's a, it's an easier problem in the long run to solve. Um, potentially, potentially, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of trade-offs that you have to kind of look at there. Um, and but then there's, can you yeah. actually talk about a couple of them? You don't have to go super deep, but I would love to hear how you think about the trade-offs. Yeah, sure. Um, so for, you know, a couple of the candidates you're probably thinking of are uh, D helium three confused, D D confused, deuterium, deuterium, um, or uh, P boron. So a yeah, that's proton boron yeah, is proton the one boron. that, yeah. yeah. Um, um, with P boron, um, you have to get, we said that the, the peak, let's get nerdy here. The, the peak of the DT cross section, so where we get the most fusions happening, or the probability of fusion is the highest for DT at around 10 keV. Mm -hmm. For P boron, it's 100 keV. Yep. And the cross section there is still 1,000 or 10,000 orders of magnitude, sorry, not 10,000 times oh, lower, yep. right? So even if you can get up to 100 keV, even then the probability of getting fusion to happen is wow. much lower. So, wow. so there is that complication. Yeah. Um, and people, then, are, people are trying to do P boron reactions out there, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And you can get P boron to fuse, right? That, that, that's been demonstrated. Um, you can make it happen, you know, but it's just like us until this big shot that we had in December, we had plenty of DT fusions. Yeah, yeah. You just don't have, um, 
what you need in most cases is what we call propagating burn. You need to spark that and then get the burn to feed on itself. That's the only way that you can actually make the energetics, the equation work out to have more energy coming out than you put in, right? Okay, so there is a bit of a chain reaction happening. It's a, yeah, yeah, there is, there is a little bit of a chain. There is a little bit of a chain reaction. That is true, yes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, and then um, maybe talk just a little bit more about how you, uh, how your program is going to interact with commercial efforts moving forward. Is it that they, is it that they come to you guys for advice? Is that they want to use your physical equipment for experiments? How do you do this? Uh, do you call it technology transfer, or how do you do? Yeah, like, yeah okay. it is tech transfer. Yep, yep. Um, it's it's a little bit all of the above. Um, right now, for the Department of Energy, um, public private partnerships is a big thrust. Um, not just in fusion, but it kind of across the board in all different technologies, particularly um, energy and and you know climate security. Um, type uh, research. Um, so uh, right now, our job as a national lab, um, you know, is to do exactly that uh, technology transfer. So, you know, we are not a production facility. Um, we typically do things once um, after they get solved and they get passed over to other private companies or other institutions to, you know, um, commercialize. Um, so with these private companies, um, there's a number of different ways, um, you know, we do collaborate them with them, we share expertise, but there's also tools that we have built up over the decades. And these include the computer simulation tools, um, the facilities, mm. um, and then other component technologies that we might have here as well. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we sign contracts with some of these private companies where they contract us to help develop a specific thing they need. Um, or uh, we built up a collaboration um, with multiple private companies. And we say, hey guys, like, what do you all need in common? Um, you know, what we call pre-competitive technologies, technologies that everybody will need at some point. Those are the type of technologies we focus on at the national labs to develop, and then everybody can use them equally. Cool, great. Okay. Well, we're running low on time though. You covered so much material in an hour. It was just amazing talking to you for this. But so I'm going to give you the final word though. What else would you like our audience to think about, know about, understand, or you can even end just with your, you know, what your hopes for the future are? Yeah, no, um, I think I, we're so hopeful about, about fusion um, and its potential. Um, what we're trying to do now though, is develop the fusion industry, the ecosystem in a way that is equitable, diverse, and just. And that means not just, you know, developing workforce that is diverse, but really thinking about now, like, you know, where would you site a nuclear fusion power plant, right? Um, you know, they're, they're safe, right? Their, their footprint is no bigger than probably what a coal power plant would look like, right? So, you know, hopefully people are amenable to having that in their backyard, but we need to communicate out what those benefits are. Um, and then the other way we're thinking about it, back to the, the equity thing is, you know, where would you put these power plants that are most beneficial to society? We don't want this to be an energy source that only benefits the rich folk, right? The privileged folk. It is something that could really be an enormous step change in lifting the standard of living um, of, of folks everywhere, and especially in developing countries as well. Um, and so, um, you know, I guess what I'm trying to get to is we need help, not just on the scientific and technical side, um, but on the policy side, um, you know, understanding what the user base is, um, uh, working with communities and outreach. Um, and so, you know, we, we're just starting out now. It's a really exciting time and we hope people will consider Fusion um, as a career and join us in this challenge. Tammy Ma, everybody. and initiate at least a new approach to the many difficult problems that must be solved in both private and public conversations. If the world is to take off the inertia imposed by fear and is to make positive progress toward peace.